Welcome, Jeremy Tracy here from Tracy Boards. And once again, I am not wearing my Tracy Boards hat. I am here as my NCA board member hat. And I've got two of my four favorite fellow board members in Andrew Hutchinson and Connor Ryman joining me. If you haven't already watched the overview video we did, uh, just covered high level what the new NCA tour plan is to roll it out and uh, take the greatest game on earth to an entirely new level. And uh, Andrew and Connor and myself thought it would be a great idea for us to have a little more casual conversation and dive a little deeper on some of the philosophies, some of the some of the thinking behind what the NCA wants to do to grow this great game. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my good buddy, Andrew. All right. Thanks, Jeremy. And thanks, Connor, for uh, for joining me uh, for this uh little interview. Uh, I guess my first question is, so up until this point, the NCA season always has started with the World Crokinole Championships and uh, culminated with the Ontario Singles Championships. Can you describe the shift uh, to the new season that we're making? And what do you see as some of the benefits uh, that the shift will provide? Yeah, absolutely. I can uh, I can say a couple things about that. Uh, the National Crokinole, Crokinole Association Tour has, since its inception, uh, started with the World Crokinole Championships every year on the first Saturday in June. Uh, we are we have uh, voted officially to change that so that the tour season is now going to officially end with the World Championship. The World Championship is the Crokinole season's flagship event. We felt that uh, that it is something that should be uh, should be celebrated, should be built toward instead of being the sort of resetting point for a new season. So going forward, the World Championship events, both of them will be the uh, the last two events of the season. And uh, starting from the next day, that will be the uh, the starting point of the new, uh, the new NCAA Tour calendar. And I'm very excited about that. I, I would just add to that that uh, I'm out there a lot talking to people about the National Crokinole Association Tour. And a number of times I've been asked, like, why does the tour start with the Worlds? And I've never had a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the generally the people that I talk to feel that it makes more sense to have it end. And uh, as a committee, obviously, we we had that discussion and uh, there is going to be that transition year. But I think it makes a ton of sense that that will be, yeah, the pinnacle of the yeah uh, of the season. I, I'm excited for the change, too. Yeah. yeah so, so oh, yeah, go ahead, Connor. I was just going to say on the topic of that, uh, that transition year. Uh, the 2024-25 NCAA Tour season will start at the 2024 World Championship and end at the 2025 World Championship. That will add at least two uh, two new events to that NCAA calendar. So some things are going to have to shift as well. There will be a little bit of uh, a little bit of adjustment for that year, but it'll just be a one year change, and then uh, we expect to continue rolling with uh, with the calendar starting in Tavistock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for uh, uh, kind of clarifying that because that would be a, a big question. How are how are we going to make that transition? Um, so as as you mentioned, that's just kind of a one year reality of, of making this change. Um, uh, so uh, the other thing I'd like to kind of point out uh, uh, a minor change is we are we are changing uh, the the how we count a player's score uh, total score from their top four tournaments to their top five tournaments and i think this is just in recognition one of the fact that a lot of people are coming out to more tournaments these days and so uh, and it kind of encourages people to to make more tournaments and the other uh the other reason that we're we're making this change or another reason we're making this change is uh, we're hoping to see uh, some sort of a geographical expansion in tournaments uh, and that kind of uh, transitions me nicely to the next uh, question and topic so I'll jump into that now so my second question is uh, the NCA has decided to go with a tiered tournament structure can you provide an overview of the tiers and explain some of the reasoning behind adopting this model. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we are we are shifting to a three tiered system. There will be three tiers of tournaments, which we think will allow for a greater geographical expansion. As you were saying, Andrew, uh, the top tier of tournaments, tier one, is going to uh, to consist of 
probably just about all of the current uh, the current NCA tournaments. They are the highest uh, highest standard of competition. They are the highest standard of organization, and we expect that they will be the NCA's core events. As such, they are they are sort of regarded uh, in that uh, in that high light. So tournaments that uh, have achieved tier one status receive calendar and geographic exclusivity. So a, uh, a tournament that's tier one cannot have another tier one event scheduled within three weeks and 500 kilometers of any other, which uh, which provides you know, some space to make sure all the top players can get to those tier one tournaments. And uh, and of course, those tier one tournaments get the most points awarded to uh, to the players who finish well in them. So they are they are really the NCA's highest level events. Yeah, that's uh, would somebody else like to talk about tiers two and three. I was going to say, uh, it, as a as a dual citizen, Connor, perhaps you can do the translation for our American friends that that five hundred kilometers is going to be a, approximately three hundred miles. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I. I, just to speak a little bit more on the reason for the tiers is that uh, it is it is going to be harder to win a tier one tournament than perhaps a tier two or a tier three tournament. Therefore, the points it, it really should be worth more uh, to win those than it is to to win a, a tier two or tier three. And I, I think our long long term goal is that you know tournaments that start as a tier two will make their way up, or sorry, start as a tier three, will make their way up to a tier two if that's what they want. And the tier twos would then obviously, uh, you know, if they if they show the track record, if they reach the criteria we're looking for, they absolutely have that opportunity. The long-term goal is that there are tier one events all over North America, if not the world. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And uh, and the the lower tiers we're we're sort of placing them that way because they they kind of have to be that way in the metaphor. But that absolutely doesn't that's that's not making any value statement about the quality of play, the quality of competition, any of that sort of stuff. These are all high level NCA events and uh, and a good standard of uh, of play, of camaraderie as well as competitiveness is uh, is to be expected at these events that are that are recognized by the NCA. So uh, tier two events are uh, they they are for for uh, places, clubs, organizers who are maybe a little bit newer to the game who have organized some things, but uh, but either uh, don't have the experience or perhaps don't get the turnout that's required for tier one tournaments. And as such, uh, there are a number of, of specific requirements that, uh, that a tournament needs to meet to get into any of the tiers. But uh, but tier twos are a little bit more relaxed than tier one, while still uh, having that sort of competitive uh, that competitive edge, that the preserved uh, competitive balance. And yeah. then, oh, sorry, I was I was just going to jump in quickly to uh, to talk a little bit about tier three tournaments, if that's okay. So um, please, please. and and feel free to add anything. But uh, our hope for tier three tournaments is um, the. A couple of things. One is for maybe uh, clubs uh, or organizers who haven't organized a tournament before, but they still want it to be a part of the NCA, or maybe they've organized one or two tournaments, but they're they're quite uh, inexperienced in in organizing tournaments. And this is a great way for them to kind of develop a relationship with the NCA, still be uh, NCA sanctioned, uh, but. Uh, it gives them a little bit more flexibility. It doesn't require as uh, as high a turnout and, and so on. Uh, the other, uh, I think, exciting thing about a tier three tournament is we're also allowing for uh, experimental formats. So uh, MC tournaments to this point have followed relatively quite close uh, or similar formats. And the, the tier three events will allow for some experimentation and and maybe uh, maybe the NCA will then allow for some of those formats if if they prove successful for the higher tiers. So I don't know if uh, either of you want to uh, touch on that point at, at all. The one of the thoughts that just popped up is that um, there's a number of people that I talk to that they will they will express some some fear or intimidation or reservation about going and playing in an NCAA tournament. They have this, like, uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe Hutch looks intimidating on YouTube when you watch him on there, 
but uh, there, there are people that are intimidated. And I, and I think the same is true for organizers. They're like, oh, I'd like to be a part of the NCA, but maybe they feel like the bar is, is set really high, which is what we want. And we also want it to be welcoming. So, you know, if, if, uh, if you're out there, you, you're running a club or you're part of a club or you want to run a tournament that this kind of lowers the bar a little bit, lowers the expectation, but allows you to get yourself involved with the nca i mean it's an amazing community we want to see it grow and and uh a lot of the changes that we're we're making is because we want more people to feel welcome both as players and as organizers to come in and uh and help take this to a new level definitely and sort of to that end uh the part of the goal of tier three is uh, is to facilitate what we uh, what we described as the geographical expansion of the nca uh, as uh, as I've been told, uh, Nathan Walsh, who previously, to very little exaggeration, has been the uh, the administration of the NCA, he uh, he has received emails coming from far and wide, coming from coming from Europe, uh, the Middle East, and as far as Australia, saying, "Hey, we're running a tournament. We'd love for it to be on the NCA," and that just hasn't uh, hasn't really made a lot of sense in the past, and that is where. Uh, those tournaments, I think, will fit in fantastically in tier three. Tiers yep. uh, tier one definitely has a has a requirement that you need a certain number of of Crokinole Center's top players to attend regularly for your tournament to maintain that high status. Uh, I I don't remember if tier two does as well, uh, but since it does not, cool. Uh, uh, that's what those those two lower tiers two and three uh, allow for for tournaments all over the world to be involved in the NCA, to be a part of this of this high standard for competitive Grokino that we've fostered uh, while while still, you know, existing across the globe. If I could just uh, just to throw this in there for everyone watching, um, don't worry about taking notes. We're going to have links in the video description below this that will direct you to where exactly on the NCA page you can find these documents, what the tier standards are, and obviously we're here to answer questions. We may end up even doing a, a follow-up interview like this if we have a lot of the same question come in. Uh, but, and we also, I think we're going to dig into it here eventually, but uh, we're also going to have documents that help people. It's like, hey, I don't know how to run a tournament or I don't have as much experience as you guys. And it's not a prescriptive. It's not like this is how you have to do it. It is guidelines that will just help people just the goal is that we're, we want to help set you up for success with your first tournament and every tournament that you do. And uh, we want to be here as a resource um, to help foster the growth of, of Crokinole. So, yeah. Absolutely. yeah sure. Oh yeah. So um, I guess uh, my next question is kind we've kind of touched on the different point structures uh, a bit um, for the different tiers. Um, and so I just wanted to, to, discuss that uh, in more in more depth. So my question is, can you share how the new point structure will look and why the NCA thinks that this is a positive step to take at this point in time? And I will, uh, I'll share the point structure uh, so that everybody can kind of uh, get a, a visual of that also. Yeah. Uh, I can say a couple of things here. I think this uh, this point structure will be a very strong good for the NCA. Uh, the uh, the there are two really big changes that are hitting at face value. Of course, to go along with the tiering system, there are different uh, different valuations for the three different tiers. So just looking at a win in each tier, it's fifty points still as it has been for all NCA tournaments prior. A win now in a tier one tournament, the highest standard of competition, gets you fifty points regardless of its singles or doubles. It's 40 points for tier two and 35 points for tier three. And you just whatever your top five scores are, regardless of what tier they come from, those go toward your NCA ranking. So there is there's no limitation on it. We'd previously considered that you could only have a certain number of tier three or tier two tournaments count toward your ranking. But we decided to do away with that. This is uh, you, you have your five best numbers coming out of this uh, this ranking system that uh, that makes up your NCA uh, rating. The other thing that's uh, that's noticeable here is that the breakdown after uh, the first position between singles and doubles tournaments is now different. Uh, 
Uh, it is in our in the view of the NCA board and uh, and competition and rules committee. It's easier, for example, to finish fourth in a doubles tournament than it is to finish fourth in a singles tournament, because there are simply fewer people ahead of you in a doubles tournament or fewer teams ahead of you. Uh, and uh, it's uh, the the differing breakdowns. I think will uh, will reflect what uh, what sort of needs to be achieved to uh, to get to those rankings in in the different styles of tournaments. If if I can add to that. Um... A lot of thought did go into this. The uh, Connor is the chair of the of the rules and competition committee, and him and the board put a tremendous amount of work in. And there were actually some different proposals were put forward. And in my opinion, the reason we settled in on this one, it was the best the best combination of what was simple and easy to understand, as well as what was going to help with again with the growth of the game. I feel like I'm I'm beating that drum, but that that really was important. There were other there were others that were put forward that I felt were also awesome, uh, but maybe a little bit too complicated. And we don't want to we don't want to intimidate people with the complexity of this either. Um, I, I think it's very similar to a lot of the rules of Crokinole, where our goal is to uh, to keep them simple and clean and not something that creates a lot of confusion, but also creates an environment where we can actually compete and not have too much grayness in there so uh would you agree with that connor is that fair absolutely this this adds yeah. uh, a good bit of balance without uh without bringing in too much uh sort of unnecessary complexity mm -hmm. be easily intelligible to anyone who looks at it yeah yeah and i guess a couple points for me uh one is as we've kind of touched on uh a main selling point for this this model is that it uh, it allows for the expansion of more NCA tournaments uh, without kind of throwing out uh, throwing off the competitive uh, balance. We we realize that winning a tier one tournament with the top players uh, is is more challenging than winning maybe a tier three tournament where there's a lot of uh, maybe. Uh, newer players, um, and it's great that those tournaments exist, and those tournaments are now have the opportunity to be a part of the NCA. Uh, but we also uh, want to kind of value a a victory in in each uh, accordingly, um, and and we we feel like this does a great job. So uh, winning a tier one um, is fifty points, as as Connor mentioned. Winning a tier two is. 40 points, which is uh, the exact same as you would get for sixth place at a tier one tournament. And winning a tier three tournament is 35 points, which is uh, the equivalent of coming 11th in a tier one tournament. So uh, we, we tried to kind of balance um, uh, allowing NC more NCA tournaments in that expansion, but also to kind of um, keep the keep the valuation uh, fair based on the, the level of competition. Um, the other point I would like to kind of just mention is uh, a little chit that all, a lot of the talk we've had so far is kind of at the, the top of the, the, uh, the structure. Um, uh, we also made a change at the kind of near the bottom where we, um, where previously it was only if you, uh, the points would descend down to 20 points um, we've made it descend all the way down to one point. And the reason for doing that is there are, there's just more people coming to tournaments. And so we were having some tournaments where maybe the 30th place person would get 20 points and the 50th place person would also get 20 points. Uh, so by kind of descending all the way down to one, uh, then we, we, we feel like, uh, that can kind of give give extra incentive for for players to to really compete even if they're not at at the top so uh yeah that that's a a minor point but i think it'll it'll make a big difference for for uh for some of the intermediate and lower level players to have that chance to kind of fight for those those points um yeah so i'm going to move on to uh my next question uh and this question is going to be uh with regards to the uh basically the the uh the tournament sanctioning application process so for any uh any prospective tournament or new tournament um 
uh, or or even returning tournaments. So what what do they need to do to apply for NCA sanctioning? Yeah, so this is uh, this is I think a, a straightforward and and pretty understandable document that uh, that the NCA has devised as an application for sanctioning. Uh, the I think that there's all sorts of uh, of relatively straightforward again aspects on here. Things like the name of your tournament, the location, who's running it, how to get in touch with them, and importantly, the tentative date of the tournament. This is especially important for tier one tournaments due to that uh, calendar and geographic exclusivity that tier one tournaments have. Uh, we don't need you to get bang on to the date, but as close as possible and at least the month and like maybe the sort of range in the month if you're going, if you're shooting for early, give us, give us an estimation. It uh, It's not set in stone at your application date. You can still have probably a little bit of wiggle room. Then formatted the tournament and a couple of, uh, of of statements making sure that you have read through the tournament tips document, tournament tips and rate and standards document, which we're going to talk about in a moment. Uh, we also on the at the top of the second page, there's a uh, a prompt asking you to uh, to talk about prizes as an estimated percentage of net income. This I think has the potential to be a confusing question. Uh, and this was a point of contention for uh, for the competition committee. What we want to know here is where is the registration money going? Uh, we know that a certain amount of uh, of what you raise in registration fees as a tournament organizer is going to go to fixed costs, effectively, to booking the location, to getting lunch taken care of, to potentially even uh, securing door prizes and things. There's all manner of little, uh, little tiny expenses, printing scorecards, getting pens, pencils, all that sort of stuff. But after all those expenses are taken away, what uh, what are you going to do with the money? Does everything else that come in go back out to, uh, to tournament participants as prize money? Are you using the tournament as a fundraiser for, uh, for some external charity? Uh, is it going to is the money raised going to support your club or your organization? And uh, and we don't need uh, extraordinary specifics. We just I think want uh, want an idea of what you're doing with uh, with the money. Am I, am I fair in saying that, gentlemen? Yeah, I'll I'll jump quickly on that point. Uh, so um, that question in particular, it's not. It's not going to determine whether you are approved or not approved for NC sanctioning. It's more of a kind of a data gathering tool for us uh, so that we can kind of get, get a sense of, of what tournaments are doing. So there's nothing wrong with um, using using tur uh, like tournament funds or what, what has been raised from entry fees on helping out your club or whatever. That, like that's not an issue. Like or doing a, a fundraiser that that's not a bad thing we're, we're just trying to kind of gather that information so i uh, yeah, ju just wanted to kind of mention that point specifically uh anticipating that there might be some questions about it um are there any other I, thoughts on on the document uh or the process in general if i if i could just add to that like i made the comment earlier that we're, we're trying to lower the intimidation factor or, or make it more welcoming to people and while we're while I I believe I'll speak I'll speak for myself that that is that's how I feel about it. Um, in my opinion, we don't want to lower the bar so far. Like we want to make sure that people are legitimately looking to put effort in and run a legitimate tournament. If you're having three of your beer drinking buddies over on Saturday night and uh, you you think you're going to call it an NCA tournament, no. Uh, we we just want to know that you're you're doing something legitimate. That is uh, that is in the spirit of Crokinole and in the spirit of the NCA. So um, more, I, I feel like more of those questions are just getting a feel for who it is that's that's trying to get a seat at the table. Well said. Uh, any mm -hmm. other uh, any other thoughts on this? The last thing I would say is. Um, uh, just just kind of a heads up for any any of the kind of returning tournaments that are looking to um, uh, be in tier uh, one, there will be a deadline, which I believe is uh, May 15th, 2024, to fill this out uh, for to to be able to be a tier one tournament for the upcoming season. Um, as Connor said, if you don't have your tournament date 
exactly uh, locked down, you can just put a, a tentative tournament date. But our, our goal is to uh, uh, be somewhat professional in, in, in the NCA and be able to kind of have a, a tour schedule uh, at the, the beginning of the season, at least with the tier one tournaments. And the uh, requirements for tier two and tier three tournaments are less so, so that uh, you, you have, uh, you, you can, you can kind of apply closer to your tournament date. Uh, so, so that's the last thing that I want to, to mention with that. Uh, with that being said, we'll uh, discuss kind of the last, uh, last document, and then, uh, and then maybe talk about the whole chain, uh, these changes uh, on a more general basis. So my uh, question is, uh, or a comment is the competition committee also updated the tournament tips document and revamped it as a tournament tips and standards document. The first three sections contain recommendations based on wisdom acquired by tournament organizers, and the fourth section contains minimum requirements for any tier one or tier two tournaments. Uh, my question is, how do you see tournament organizing utilizing this document? And what are some important points in the document that you, you would like to highlight? Yeah, absolutely. I I think this, uh, my as the chair of the competition committee, I, I feel uh, entitled to speak about this. This is, uh, this is a document that my committee has spent a lot of time working on, and we think that it is dramatically improved. The last time this document was uh, was updated, I think, was in 2017. So for uh, for the NCA moving forward, moving into the into the mid 2020s, uh, this is uh, is really thoroughly updated for a changing Crokino landscape. Uh, the first three sections, as uh, as Andrew said, are more sort of recommendations, things observed and distilled from the flow of Crokino tournaments that have happened, and recommendations. That uh, that new tournament organizers, especially, uh, can look to to uh, to sort of set up a tournament that will flow neatly in ways that have been been sort of tried and 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 proven by uh, by over a decade of NCA tournament play, a decade and a half almost. Uh, and part four is what's uh, what's really new uh, to this document. This is what we're uh, what we're saying is going to be required. Uh, parts one through three are all general recommendations but part four is specific requirements for tournaments to meet uh the criteria for ncas tiers one and two uh this lays out stuff about uh the equipment and the setup within the within the space as well as some formatting and rules and organizational uh, requirements and uh i think this is a, a very clear concise document the uh the tournament standards section especially was designed to be uh, as kind of skeletal as possible. This is what is required. Uh, you can still kind of uh, build it and make it your own on top of this, but this is what's absolutely necessary. And then tacked on at the end uh, in the final sort of appendix are two documents that are designed to be posted at tournaments uh, for anyone with any rules, questions, or qualms to uh, to go to on tournament day, uh, that's those are just sort of all-purpose things uh, to make sure that anything can be settled quickly and efficiently, and hopefully uh, as painlessly as possible. Oh. Uh, with the notable statement at the very end of it that if there if a situation arises that's outside the stipulations of these documents, it is up to the tournament organizer, and their decision shall be final. And that's something that uh, that we have to respect here. Yeah, and I would uh, just say kind of about this document, but all of the documents, these these are going to be kind of reviewed on an annual basis by the competition committee. Uh, so they're kind of living, breathing documents that uh, as as we um, as we learn things, as new tournaments uh, provide feedback on their experience, as our returning tournaments provide feedback on their experience, uh, can change. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess on on the tournament tips and standards document. I, uh, before I forget, like and all of the documents, but specifically this one, need to give a big shout out to Connor and the competition committee uh, for for all the work that you you did on this. Um, 
yeah, uh, I don't know if uh, Jeremy, if you have any any comments or thoughts on on this document. Yeah, I was going to say, like with each of these questions you've asked, Andrew, I, I've let Connor go first because he is the the chair of the competition committee who puts so much work into this. Uh, one, I wanted to like give him that space to do that, and two, I just felt he was better equipped to speak to it first. Um, I my thought to add to that, in case it isn't already clear. It's my belief that that document was put together with the hope to lift people up, not to hold them back in any way. It's not meant to be restrictive of of you don't have exactly this many square feet. You're not allowed to have a tournament kind of thing. Like you know, I talk to different people uh, in different areas where, you know, they might have an L shaped room or whatever. We need to we need to give tournament directors the the latitude to figure things out and, and make it work. And uh, that's the hope that it's just helping people. Um, helping people get off to the best, you know, set people up for success, get them off on the best foot possible. Um, if you're out there, you're considering running a tournament, I promise you your first tournament will not be the best tournament you ever run. Uh, your second one will be a little bit better than the first. Uh, and in my, in my mind, this document is to help you make that first one probably as good as your second one would have been without the help of this document and uh, and the people behind it. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely agreed. I, I want to echo everything that Jeremy said there. That's uh, this is this is an aspirational thing. Yes, there is part four is sort of hard and fast regulations for the top two tiers, but uh, but everything else is suggestions. Simply put, it is this this is what has what has worked in the past. It may it may work for you. It may not. And uh, and this is just a a suggestion in parts one through three of things that we know to work. And you, uh, as prospective tournament organizers, have the ability to shape that into what will work best for you. Mm -hmm. Of course, you, you're very generous to offer some uh, some thanks to uh, to me for organizing this, but uh, but I do want to give a a quick shout out to the uh, the four other members of my committee: to Mark Ponzio, Nathan Walsh, Ray Beerling, and Claire Kipfer, without whose work uh, this would not have been possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, yep. And yeah, so just to kind of comment on on something you you both touched on is uh, we've also had the experience. I uh, I know myself and Jeremy have had the chance to go down to the U.S. Open their their first year in 2019 uh, and subsequent years, and that's an example of a tournament that. Um, we have learned th things from. And so yep. just because we're kind of giving these recommendations, we don't want to, we don't want to step on or trample your creativity. And, and we also acknowledge that um, as you run these tournaments, um, th there's things that we can learn and, and that might, th things that might spread to other tournaments. So uh, we, yeah, we're, we're kind of providing recommendations and, and some, some, uh, hard and fast requirements for the the top two tiers, but um, also be creative. And uh, we, we expect to, and hope to, to learn from you uh, just as, as you're, you're kind of learning from us. So uh, yeah, yeah just, just, just to make that clear, we're, our, our goal is not to kind of uh, talk down, but, uh, but just to, to kind of work with and, and, and help. So yeah, um, I guess I'll say uh, if, I encourage everybody, especially if you're considering uh, organizing a tournament, um, even if you never even thought of a, the the possibility of it being an NCA tournament, I I would invite you to make that have that consideration, uh, consider it being uh, applying to be an NCA tournament, and and to look at the documents in in the. Uh, uh, there's links in the description of this video and it's on the, the National Crokinole Association website. Uh, so take a look at those documents. If you do have any questions, um, send a, an email to uh, nationalcrokinole at gmail.com. Uh, we can put that in the uh, the description too and, uh, and we'll answer. And as Jeremy said, if there's kind of common frequently asked questions, we can maybe do a follow-up video if, if it or or a social media post or something uh, if it if it's necessary. Um, so we've kind of talked a lot about specifics, and I want to kind of end off on a a bigger picture note because uh, I don't want all this the uh, details to kind of get in the way of of our excitement about these changes. So uh, my last uh, open ended question is: um, with all of this in mind, 
How do you see these changes impacting the NCA and the expanding crokinole world in general? And what are you most hoping to result from these new structures? I, I'm going to jump in on this one first, Connor. Sorry, I've been I've been uh, chomping, chomping at the bit too with what's on my mind here. Uh, and I what's on my mind, I, I hope answers your question as well. Um, for the past six years, I've had the opportunity to travel a lot and visit a lot of different crokinole clubs. And it has been absolutely incredible to watch the skill level grow. Uh, with each year I go back to these PAX events, every year the competition goes up and up and up. And a lot of that is to do with these clubs that are starting. So people are getting together more regularly, playing competitive crokinole. I'm also out there, I'm talking to more and more people who are not only willing, but excited to travel and go to other places and meet other crokinole clubs. Um, the friendships that I'm watching build across these, across these different communities is absolutely amazing. Um, what am I hoping to see? I hope that that trend continues and expedites. Um, that that's what I'm hoping to see. I'm hoping to see a whole bunch of tournaments uh, jump in at tier three and then, you know, uh, then work their way up through so that there are tier one tournaments all over the place. Um, if you're sitting there listening to this and, and you're even a little bit excited to be a part of this, I mean, this is your opportunity to, to, to step up as a leader in your area, help bring an NCA tournament to your, to your community, to your town, to your club, and, you know, the, the tools that we're putting forward here as an NCA board are designed to help you be successful faster and easier. And I can tell you, it is work to run a tournament. I don't think we can sugarcoat that. If you want to run a good tournament, it takes work. But, man, it's fun. It is so satisfying. Um, yeah. Yeah. Ran out of gas. That's all I got. <laughs> I, I love all that, Jeremy. And. One one thing that I'm sort of particularly excited for is we've seen uh, we've seen over the last couple of years some some sort of suggestions, some inklings that other other tours may be sprouting up across the world, and we saw one actually properly come to fruition in the UK. Uh, and what I would sort of love to see is those tours run almost parallel to the NCA, the NCA becoming this this at least at least multinational, if not sort of global institution that uh, that's, that sort of is continues to be the main channel for Crokono, but runs there are several other uh, other tours like Crokono UK could easily uh, have all of its tournaments become part of the NCA tour and uh, and also serve a sort of dual function. They can be their own uh, their own entity while uh, while also being part of the NCA. And with that uh, with that sort of carrot dangled out there, let's say. There's a tier two tournament that's running in the middle of July, in uh, in central London, and then uh, you know somebody's some Ontario-based Crokinole player is saying, you know, I was planning a planning a vacation out there anyway. Let me just nudge my plans around a little. I'll get out to that tournament as well, and I'll play some Crokinole while I'm on vacation. What more could you ask for? Right. I think uh, sort of spreading this out across the world is a great way to uh, just to bring the community together, closer together on a larger scale than it ever has been. That's that's why I'm really especially excited about this. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, sorry, go ahead, Andrew. Oh, no, go ahead, Jeremy. I was just gonna say like, a question that I get asked sometime, which it, which is a bit of a variant of this, is is basically like, uh, you know, what if there was $10,000 on the line? What if there was a million dollars on the line? How big is Crokinole going to get? And, uh, my answer to that, like I joke that I want to see Crokinole in the Olympics, but I'm not really joking. Um, and I, uh, something I always try to add in there, like I want to see Crokinole grow, like just grow exponentially. And my hope is that as it gains popularity and the level of competition raises, I hope that it always holds on to its wholesome roots. Uh, I mean, I've never seen, even in the world championships, I've never seen a disagreement that the players couldn't just figure out in a very sportsmanlike way and then just get back to playing. And I hope we never, ever lose that. And uh, so far, I mean, I am seeing that grow, if anything, just like the um, I'll PG this. I'll PG this a little bit because it's going out on YouTube. I say that Crokinole is a jerk repellent 
with a 99.9% success rate. We're not, we're not batting a thousand, but we are so stinking close. It seems to attract nothing but really good people. And uh, yeah, I, I just hope that trend continues. Yeah, I would guess I, uh, some things I would share uh, kind of along the same lines as of both of you is um, up, up until this point, the National Crokinole Association, despite its name, has been uh, in reality basically a Southwestern Ontario Crokinole Association. Uh, we've had a tournament across the border uh, in the Tuscarora Nation, the Turtle Island um, uh, Crokinole Tournament um, for a number of years. Uh, but besides that, it was just in Ontario. And then uh, more recently, the U.S. Open for the, the last couple of years. Um, but if if we're going to call ourselves the National Crokinole Association, uh, we, we should probably be more than just an Ontario Crokinole Association. And I believe that this is the first uh, step towards that. And I think uh, we've provided a way that... Um, uh, tournaments and clubs uh, across North America and beyond have the ability to, uh, if they desire, uh, to to apply to become uh, a, a, a sanctioned tournament uh, and to join the tour. Um, I don't know where that's going to go uh, in five, 10 years, but I'm excited about it. And mm -hmm. the other thing I would say is um, with with more more tournaments, um, it gives it gives people outside of southwestern Ontario um, an opportunity to no longer just observe the NCA, but to become a part of the NCA. And yep. so if if you're in South Carolina, if you're in Texas, if you're in Baltimore, just to name a few Crokinole hot Kansas dogs, City, Northwest, Kansas Denver, Denver uh, Seattle yep. uh, or Washington State, I see one coming. Um yeah, if you're in any of these areas, you may have watched NCA Crokinole tournaments on YouTube, maybe followed standings, and and that's that's a bit about as far as you go. Maybe consider going to a tournament, but now you can have an NCA tournament. Uh, a neighboring club can have an NCA tournament. You can uh, work your way to uh, getting three, four, five results in a season, and and maybe it means. You, you get four results from relatively close to you and you want that fifth result. So you decide to come up to one of the, the, the tier one tournaments that, that are currently kind of in, in the Ontario area. Obviously that can change, but, but that's where, where they'd be at this point. And uh, so I, I hope it uh, encourages people to travel to, to what has traditionally been where the NCA has operated and I hope it goes both ways. I hope people in uh, that have traditionally gone to NCA tournaments will also travel to other ones. I believe that the best way to uh, have people improve is to play against tough competition. Uh, and the more you do it, the better you'll get. Um, we already have um, the world champion is, is, uh, is American, is, is residing in Indiana. The uh, current NCA tour leader is uh, in, in Indiana. Um, and I know Jeremy has definitely come across a lot of people. I've come across some people uh, all over the, uh, the states and, and so on who uh, and, and overseas who are very strong. And um, yeah, I, I expect that uh, the world's champion will... Uh, within year, a few years will more often be coming from uh, all these different areas than, rather than just from Ontario. And um, it means that us in Ontario have to raise our game, but uh, it's, it's an exciting challenge to have. And yeah, um, the World Crokinole Championship, uh, it, it would be great if uh, more and more people from the world attend. Uh, National Crokinole yep. Association, it would be great if it's uh, geographically, uh, uh, bigger and more expansive than what it has been to this point. And uh, that, that's what, what I'm excited about. I think, I think we've taken the first step. It's not the only step, but I think it's the first step towards that. Uh, and I hope that tournaments apply and I hope people uh, 
really consider going to various NCA tournaments, both ones that have existed and new ones. So that's what I'm excited about. I just, I just got two things to share. One, I want to, I agree with you that up until, up until recently, other than two NCA events that take place in New York, it's mostly been a Southwestern Ontario thing. Um, I don't, I don't think that that has been a lack of willingness for the NCA to grow. We just didn't have, we didn't have a means. We didn't know, we didn't know how, but with the recent, you know, structuring of the NCA, and that's been a big part of our mandate this past year is to like, what, yeah. How do we, how do we get from here to there? It's something we want. It's something the people want. How do we, how do we meet people where we're at? And uh, the only other thing is, I mean, I was already excited about the future of Crokinole, but in the last 45 minutes, that excitement has grown. Um, and I hope the people watching feel this. If they're still watching now, they got to be excited about Crokinole. Come on. <laughs> Ought to be. Yeah. <laughs> That's. I think you're. You guys are both bang on here. And like, so Southwest Ontario may be the sort of heartland of Crokinole, but it is uh, the the fire is spreading here. It's it's yep. going it's going worldwide, and uh, and and we want to be right there. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um. Are there any other thoughts on on any of this? I think we go. All right. Um, I want to thank uh, Connor and Jeremy for uh, for joining me with this. I want to thank the competition committee. Um, and yeah, again, check out those documents. Uh, send send us an email if you have questions. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for for watching. And we're we're excited. Uh, so thank you. <laughs>